So yeah, um, I've got this proposition on the screen here that I wrote during the break. This is the, the issue that we were having. Here's how to solve it. Um, if you have a martingale with respect to filtration and you've got a stopping time, we know that the stopped process is a martingale with respect to the stopped filtration. That's what we proved before, but it is also a martingale with respect to the original filtration. And that's probably a more fundamental fact actually. And the proof is not that hard, but it's hard to do when you're on the spot giving a lecture you have to write the stopped process as a sum over the values of the stopping time, if you know that sort of technique. And then from that, you can eat, also say like, yeah, if I look at this different sequence of the two, then it's actually the original different sequence times the set where n's less than or equal to t. Because if n were greater than t, min n t here would be t, and min n minus one t would also be t, right? And you'd have ft minus ft, that would be zero. So when n is less than or equal to t, you've got the original difference sequence and otherwise you have a zero. And then you can say, right, this set where n is less than or equal to t, that's the complement of the set where t is less than or equal to n minus one. This is a nice little discrete time trick that you can't do in continuous time. If you're not n, you're actually one step behind. So this set is actually a n minus one measurable. It's not immediately clear from when you write it like that. So when you take its a n minus one conditional expectation, you can actually take that characteristic function outside the expectation. And you're left with the conditional expectation of the original Martingale's different sequence, which is zero. Yeah, that's how that works. So back in this proof here where we said, where did we use this? Yeah, this step up here, where I've said, okay, the, the different sequence of, with respect to the filtration A, of the stop process, you know, does what it should. It does indeed do what it should. This makes a bit more sense in the notes, but uh, I think I still skipped over this fact there somewhere. I might have to fix that. Let's get back to the, the rest of the proof. If we want to write F as a sum of A, B, and C, where A, B, and C have nice properties, um, someone needs to, to mute themselves. Everybody needs to mute themselves. Good. Um, We've shown that there, we've written f, we've written a as f minus ft, and we've said a's got nice properties. So now we just need to find b and c, right? Where am I in my own notes? What we need now is functions b and c such that f minus a equals b plus c, because then f is a plus b plus c. Um, we'll define, rather than defining B and C directly, we're going to define them through their different sequences. We're going to define Martingale different sequences, and we're going to show that they do actually determine functions. They'll determine Martingales trivially, but not every Martingale determines a function. So we'll define DBN and DCN directly. So since F minus A is the stopped function F sub T by the definition of A. What we need to do is we need to define these different sequences DBN and DCN such that their sum by linearity is the difference of FT, which luckily, as I showed just then, <laughs> is the difference of the stop process. We need this for all N. And what we showed, like I've, I've actually written part of this proof um, that I just showed before in my notes, it turns out this difference is equal to the characteristic function of n less than or equal to t times the difference of f, as I just mentioned before. And since this stopping time t is just the minimum of r and s, we can write this as characteristic function of n less than or equal to r times characteristic function of n less than or equal to s times dfn. Have I done that right? Should there not be a union? Should there not be a sum? Oh yeah, because this is less than or equal to t. t is a minimum, so if you're... Is this correct? Have I, I've confused myself. Okay, I trust Tim that it's correct. <laughs> 
So then let's look at this R in particular, N less than or equal to R, and let's split that into the cases N equals R and N less than R. And let's keep S as it is. And this right, this shows that we can write DFN as a sum of two terms, this one corresponding to that and the one corresponding to that. And I mean, I've kind of pulled it out of nowhere, but this is a proof where a lot of things are pulled out of nowhere. We can define the, the, the difference DBN as this term. So N equals R times N less than, or my Ns look like Rs, N less than or equal to S. This is an N. DFN. By the way, this is a first pass of the definition. This is not going to work. <laughs> but what we're trying to define is this. Uh, N less than or equal to S. DFN. So if we define this, if we define DBN and DCN in this way, then their sum is DFN. The problem will be that these are not gonna be Martin-Gell difference sequences. Not immediately clear, but if you try to compute the expectations with respect to AN minus one, you'd need to have zero and you won't have zero. So you force things to work. I'm gonna modify these. I'm gonna subtract off that expectation that you'd get. What happened to my N here, it's vanished. And to compensate, I have to then add that term on DCN. So we'll define them like that. And by construction, yeah, be sum to DFN. As we need. So we need to check that they're Martingale different sequences with respect to the filtration A. So we compute the AN expectation of DBN plus one. And by construction, this is zero. We force this to be true by subtracting off this conditional expectation here. But what happens for CN or DCN plus one Turns out everything just works because by construction, this is the AN conditional expectation of DFN or F min N plus one T. Um, hang on, am I writing this right? DFN plus one. I've written my proof in a bad way. DFN plus one minus DBN plus one because we have this relation here. And both of these are, are Martin Gell difference sequences. So both of these have expectation zero. So once you, you know what's true for FN, you know it's true for DFN, you make it true for DBN, and then it's automatically true for DCN. Great. So we do have Martin Gell difference sequences DBN and DCN. What we need to do now, we need to make sure that the Martingales BN and CN, given by the different sequences that we defined before, actually converge to functions B and C. Because what we actually want to do is construct B and C. Yeah. This has to be an L1. And what I mean by that is we need convergence of the series. So the sum from N from zero to infinity of DBN and also the corresponding sum of DCN in L1. And we're actually gonna need it pointwise as well. So in L1 and pointwise almost everywhere. Now, when do we know that Martingales have these convergence properties? Um, we know it when the Barnack space X has the Martingale convergence property, right? Which is the Rodonicodine property. 
but we don't know anything about X. We're not going to make any assumptions on X. And the way we've constructed these martingales, they will have limits without any additional properties. We don't need the abstract stuff here. So first, let's look at B. And you can show that the sum over N of DBN. Um, actually, remember, we need to control this anyway. This is one of the assumptions we have on B. We need B to be so so L1 that its different sequence actually is absolutely convergent in a sense. Right. So we can actually show that this sum converges like so, like this. It's controlled by the sum over N. We take out the characteristic functions in the definition. Uh, that's the equal to S. Yep. DFN. So remember, this is basically how to find DBN. Um, I forgot I have two terms here, don't I? I've got the first one and the second one. Um, the second one will be bounded by the first one. <laughs> so there's this is a constant two here. So I'll write less than. This is uh, less than or equal to the sum over n. Now, if we look at this term here, this characteristic function times this norm of DFN, that's what we defined as vn or is it vn plus one what is vn too many quantities in this proof i forget what they are Ugh. oh no this is correct this is vn here oops sometimes i want to highlight a thing and my tablet just freaks out and says no you're not going to do that you're going to cross it out instead like an idiot Oh, whatever, VN's here, you've seen it by now. Yeah. <laughs> Back to where we were. My tablet's frozen somehow. Oh no, good, it's back. All right, this is VN times this characteristic function here. But we could ignore that characteristic function. We just say that characteristic function is less than or equal to one. So this is less than or equal to the sum of Vn. And by the argument we had before, this is the sum over N expectation of the norm of F on the set where R equals N. Remember we did that before the break when we were estimating A, something like that. And that was bounded by one because he bounded by the L1 norm of F. That tells us that B, which is the sum over N of DBN is actually defined. It exists. And in particular, when you sum that up, you sum up the norms, integrate that in L1, that's controlled by one as required. That's what we needed of B. So this function B exists and it has the property we needed. So that second term of the decomposition is all good. What about C? For C, we need, well, first we need that it exists, but once it exists, what we need is that it's bounded in L infinity. It's L infinity norms controlled by Lambda. And that it's L1 norm is controlled by one. So how do we show that C exists? We need to- Sorry, question. Uh, yeah. in the estimate one, do we actually estimate the L1 norm of DBN rather yeah, than- Yeah, I wasn't very norm? clear here. What I'm actually doing is for all, or for almost every omega, I'm estimating the norm. This is at omega. The end of omega. And then, so where does the expectation value come from? Uh, should be the expectation. Hmm. What have I done here? Uh, let me see in the previous proof. I hope I haven't messed that up. Uh, okay. I guess I don't have the expectation there yet. 
let me fix up the proof. That's a good point. Let's not do C yet, let's fix B. Let's make sure we have B correct. Let's not do that and let's just stop at this point here. I think this is all okay for each individual omega. Yeah. And now we will do the, the integral. So this as a function of omega, we can take the L1 norm off. That will be controlled by the L1 norm of the sum of Vn. Well, and this Vn is now a scalar valued function and they're all positive. So this was that expectation of the sum of Vn and that's the thing we estimated before. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. That's the right way to do this. Yeah, in particular, B exists <laughs> as a consequence as a consequence of that. Now we can do C. So what we know is that Bn plus Cn is actually equal to the stop process F min nt by construction. Uh, the Martingales F min dot t. So this stop process and the stop process B both converge in L1. Um, and pointwise, that begs the question actually, does B converge pointwise? <laughs> I didn't say that it did. Um, and we have, oh yeah. Well, once you know that a martingale converges to something in L1, then you know that the martingale is actually the, the dubbed martingale of that limit and do martingales do converge almost everywhere point-wise to their limits. We did prove that at some point. That doesn't use any Barnack space assumptions. The martingale convergence property says when you have a martingale that you don't know is associated to a function, it is associated to a function. So B is a martingale that by we've showed was associated to a function. So we have the convergence point-wise almost everywhere. So the stop process F min dot T and the martingale B both converge in L1 and pointwise almost everywhere. Thus, so does C, <laughs> because C is just the difference of two such things. Okay, so we know C exists, the function C. There exists a limit C in L1. We still need to show its properties, but at least we know it exists. Right, first we need to show that C has a nice L1 norm. And this is pretty easy because C is just the sum of B and F sub T. When you use a triangle inequality, you have that norm estimate and both of these are controlled by one and therefore so is the sum with a constant and who cares what that constant is. All right, that was the first thing. Actually, I didn't really say explicitly why that was for B. It's because the L1 norm of B is actually controlled by the sum of the norms of those differences. And that's controlled by one. It's even stronger. So C's got the appropriate L1 control. And by the almost everywhere convergence, for almost every omega, we can do a pointwise estimate for C, which is gonna give us the L infinity control that we need. So C of omega is the limit, or is the, the sum as N goes to infinity of the differences. And we write down explicitly what these are. So characteristic function of N less than R, characteristic function of N less than or equal to S, Fn plus a second term. Now, I wasn't very clear in the definition. I should have said something that I've missed. 
my tablet lets me scroll up. Yeah, the way that I define DCN here, highlight rather than scribbling. Yeah. I think you're all used to my tablet's problems by now. Half the time I want to highlight something and end up crossing it out. Yeah, I defined it as the sum of this first term plus this uh, conditional expectation. You only add these terms when n is greater than or equal to one. <laughs> Stupid tablet. Okay, it doesn't want me to write it down. There we go. Only for n greater than or equal to one. When n equals zero, you don't need this, these compensating terms. And anyway, but a, a minus one isn't defined anyway, right? So you only define these compensating terms for n greater than or equal to one. So when we go down and we try to prove this pointwise estimate when the tablet updates, Sorry about that. These are probably the first really annoying technical difficulties we've had. So we have the sum over n of this first term and then the sum for n greater than or equal to one of the conditional expectation a n minus one of characteristic function of n equals r, characteristic function of n less than or equal to s, dfn of omega. Okay. And we have two terms that we need to control here. We control them separately. It's term one, term two. Now, the way you control the first term is you say that, well, because we know that n is less than or equal to s. <laughs> I should have known that would happen. I wanted to highlight again. It's crossed it out. n less than or equal to s here. Yep. So you can write this as the sum from n equals zero to s of omega, just taking into account that characteristic function. And you can say that if r of omega is positive, What can I say here? This is f min r minus one s omega, because you're summing up the differences of fn for n less than r. So you go up to r minus one and then you stop. But it could also be that r of omega is zero, in which case this is just zero. You have no terms in that sum because of the characteristic function. You don't have any n less than zero here. So by the definition of R, so remember R is the first time where F is larger than Fn is less than, look, R is the first time where Fn or Fr is larger than lambda. And we have an R minus one here. So we know this thing is less than lambda. Or equal to. This is by the definition of the stopping time. Because you're only going up to R minus one at worst. That's the control of the first term that we needed. As for the second, let's write this out. Okay, what do we do first? If we say, okay, this set n minus n less than or equal to s by the argument that we did before, this is actually a n minus one measurable because it's the complement of the set where s is less than or equal to n minus one. So you get the a n minus one measurability and you can take that characteristic function out of the conditional expectation. Right. 
then as before, you can say this is the sum from n equals one up to s of omega, just using this characteristic function here of this conditional expectation. So when you take the norm of this thing, the norm of the second term, you can put the norm on the inside of the sum just using the triangle inequality. You have the norm of the conditional expectation, but you know that that's less than or equal to the conditional expectation of the norm function. So you can put norm of DFN, this scalar valued function here. And this function on the inside here, you will recognize as being, oh, let me re-index first before I do that. We have n minus ones everywhere. So if my tablet would let me erase, I would do that. Okay, I'll just cross it out instead. This is a sum from n equals zero to s omega minus one of the a n conditional expectation. And this here, we then have n minus r equals this is Vn, this term on the inside here. So this is Vn minus one, like that. And remember the definition of S, S was the first time for which this sum of these terms is greater than lambda. And we're summing up to the term S omega minus one. So we haven't reached that stopping time. So this is less than or equal to lambda by the definition of the stopping time S, right? So the first term and the second term are both less than or equal to lambda in norm for almost all omega. And thus the L infinity norm of C is controlled by lambda. And I think we've shown everything we needed to show now. Yeah, it's a long proof, but it works. A lot of stopping times. And we know it's useful because we've already seen that this gives you that weak type one, one estimate for Martingale transforms that we needed in showing P independence of UMD. So let me just write the consequence. UMD property is independent of P. So we don't need to talk about the UMD P property. We just talk about UMD. That's what we really needed to know. That's the end of the lecture. That's all I needed to talk about.